we live in a day and age where we as fully able, healthy people can be looking for inspiration from people who are not fully able and disabled because they will put you to shame with their achievements, with their level of fitness and their level of willpower, which I find is missing in great amounts of people now, this day and age. Uh, my great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Ayaz Bhutta, a Paralympic gold medalist who has had an inspiring uh, career and uh, which was uh, at the peak of it was achieving that gold medal in Tokyo and uh, 2020, although it wasn't 2020, it was uh, 2022. How are you, Ayaz Bhutta? Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Assalamu alaikum, Safran. How are you? I'm good. Wa alaikum, Salaam. Wa rahmatullahi It's a great pleasure to have you here today. And uh, I have been following your story from the time that when the funding was pulled towards your training when you were going towards the Tokyo Olympics or training for Tokyo Olympics. Tell us what happened then and how did you overcome that uh, obstacle? So we competed in the real 2016 Paralympics and we finished fifth uh, and we missed out on like competing for a semi-final spot, which, which is where you compete for the medal places by just one point. And we'd lost to Australia as well by, by two points. Um, so it was a very, it's very fine margins in elite sport. Um, uh, so after that, um, every four years you get funded. Um, and unfortunately we lost, we lost our funding, um, which because as a sporting, as a sport of wheelchair rugby, we hadn't really uh, medaled or won a medal in the time that any team has been in the Paralympics for Great Britain. Uh, so any European team uh, has never comp competed for a medal or beat, like won a medal um, since, you know, like Athens 2000, um, since wheelchair rugby has been uh, a sport. So um, we... Yeah, it was, a, it was pretty much a struggle, you know, like, um, you know, we were getting funded to uh, basically live out a dream, play a sport and travel the world and represent our country. Uh, but, you know, that funding got pulled, but we, that just meant we just had to work a little bit differently. We didn't, we didn't let that deter us. So the next year we actually achieved our, like retained our European gold medal, um, so we were still the European Champions in 2015, and then without the funding, we still achieved that European Championship uh, gold medal in 2017. But the big one was, you know, uh, being the first European team in in the, in the sport of wheelchair rugby to actually win a, a bronze, silver, or gold medal of, or any colour. But you know, we were aiming for the top, so that meant we had to change our team culture, uh, how we worked, and uh, every day we worked towards um, like a canvas where uh, it had legacy, trust, impact and uh, communication on there. Um, so the main one was legacy, like what kind of legacy we did we want to leave for, for the future athletes of uh, Great Britain wheelchair rugby. So we we wanted to become the history makers. Uh, you know, that, that's what we were working towards. And, you know, it didn't happen overnight. Uh, in 2018, we, uh, as a team, we got to the semi-final in the world championships uh but we lost to the australia by i think one point or maybe two points at that time uh and then the next day we actually um like capitulated the next day in the bronze medal game against the usa so you know we had to go back um review, review ourselves and in 2019 we achieved our um you know like third successive um, European Championship gold medal, but you know we were aiming for the big one again in 2020, and you know you can sense something turning in 2020 because uh, we were starting to beat the uh, teams like USA and Australia um, like months out before the Paralympics, so uh, that was a good start. And then the coronavirus hit, uh, which meant uh, we had to we had to uh, work a little bit differently again. So it, the, even though COVID hit and we were in lockdown and we we, did, we didn't give up. We, we still trained. We got equipment 
uh, bought. Um, so I've got like a little training room, which I was in every day, just doing, um, you know, lots of uh, exercises and following my, my own um, individual program. And then uh, every week we met up as a, as a squad and we did lots of uh, video analysis meetings and, you know, just refreshing uh, tactics and uh, keeping ourselves engaged. Uh, so when we got back into training, um, we were at a good level instead of having to start at the bottom, like having, uh, you know, uh, six to nine months out and uh, not doing anything. So, um, you know, that really helped us. And yeah, when we got back into uh, training and, you know, when everything started to open up, you know, we had to be really, really careful uh, because, you know, if you got COVID, um, we, you know, you, you, you know, it, it's quite detrimental to an athlete. And also the, the rules in, out in Tokyo for, for Japan were very strict about um, anyone catching COVID. You'd have to go through rigorous testing just to be allowed to, to get onto the plane. So, you know, that wasn't an option to catch COVID at that time. Otherwise, um, potentially, you'd have missed out on the, on the Paralympics. So, yeah, it, it's just having that, that inner belief. And, um, you know, all my life, you know, I've had lots of setbacks. Uh, people telling me I can't. Um, you know, play sport, um, do sport, like, you know, simple things like drive, but, you know, I, I managed to do these things. Um, so this was just another thing uh, in my life where somebody was telling me that I can't do something. Or, and then luckily I was with 11 other teammates that were, um, that were the same uh, continuous improvement thinking. And um, we achieved that, that, you know, history making gold medal. That's, that's, that's remarkable. And uh, what I really want to get across from yourself is the, the struggle that you have faced to get here because this is where the inspiration and the lessons can be drawn from. For people like myself, I mean, I'm, um, <coughs> excuse me, I've signed up for a, uh, a hike, a 22-mile a uh, hike later on in the year. And I'm actually dreading that, you know, in the sense that it's quite shameful to say that we lead largely sedentary lifestyles and we want to be fit, we want to look good, but we sometimes lack that willpower to take the leap into the unknown and do these things. And when we look at people like yourself, we find it really, really inspiring that you've achieved despite your current genetic condition. You suffer from Robert's syndrome, which you were born with. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Robert syndrome is a congenital disability uh, where I was born um, with it and it affects the growth of my limbs. So I stand at three foot seven and uh, I weigh about 45 kilograms and just just about seven stone. Um, yeah, f I spent the first year of my life in the hospital uh, just having uh, lots of operations and, you know, it wasn't, um, you know, sure that I would make, make it through that period in my life, uh, but I hope that, you know, I made it through, um, went to, went home after my first birthday and, you know, just, just had all the opportunities, um, like handed to me basically. And, you know, uh, when I was in school, um, I was very lucky to participate in sport in school, but, um, you know, it was a controlled environment, but uh, I, I still went to a mainstream school. So, um, but I was the only person with a disability in my whole entire entire school. So how did that, that how did that affect you? Uh, yeah, it was. It, I had the support, uh, so I had um, a special education needs teacher, which uh, to this day I'm still in touch with. Um, you know, um, which is quite a nice thing. Uh, you know, like uh, she supported me uh, very well throughout my school life, and any needs that I had um, were, were met. And you know, they were speaking to my parents and. You know, just that line of communication was there to provide everything that I needed, uh, and the school were great as well, and the board of governors were great. Um, and yeah, alhamdulillah, like, like um, you know, my, my primary school life was was pretty good, even though um, you know I had to have lots of operations um, uh, throughout my childhood. So I remember up until the age of fourteen, I was in and out of hospital, and um, and I missed a, a a whole year of primary school. Um, so I missed uh, I missed year five. Um, so I had to skip from year four to year six, uh, just to keep myself um, um, within my own age group, basically. Uh, and you know, like academically, it, it was a it was a challenge because it, it was always interrupted uh, with 
with, with operations, like spending weeks out and um, yeah, and just recovering. Uh, so uh, yeah, academically, I had to work a little bit harder. So I was always an average student, uh, but I was always into sports as well. So every time um, I went, um, every every weekend basically, uh, I had uh, a lo- lots of friends uh, where we used to go out in the park playing cricket, football. So I was always pretty pretty active. Um, like cricket was uh, probably my the sport I was probably the best at because uh, you just had to stand still and um, <laughs> you, <laughs> uh, I what could only hit leg side. Was it batting? Cricket, so. Yeah, batting and uh, uh, leg side on batting, so nothing offside. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, and then um, my friends used to be, let me chuck the ball, and so uh, and then we used to have like test matches, and I used to be the umpire, and I used to be a wicket as well because of my wheelchair, which is quite funny. Uh, but yeah, um, I'm there like. Um, even though I've got a disability, uh, you know, Allah has granted me like independence. Uh, alhamdulillah, like uh, so, you know, I've always been independent um, uh, over the years. Uh, you know, I can I can drive. I can you know simple things that our community things that, that things that us disabled people can't do. Like you know, uh, I get asked by people if I need help getting up in the morning or going to the bathroom or getting dressed, and I'm like, yeah, I can I can do that because. Um, my disability doesn't stop me from being um, doing all those things, and my parents always push me to to be independent, and my family as well, like uh, to try and do things that, for myself. So. That that speaks out loudly in uh, great volumes. You obviously your parents must be immensely proud of you, and your special uh, needs mentor from school, who you are still in touch with, they're obviously so proud of all the effort that they've put in for you whilst in your formative years and obviously the results are there for them yeah. to see now and uh, one question i wanted to ask was that you know disability is something which is still largely misunderstood within the south asian communities in the sense that we pigeonhole people with disabilities that we may never even think assume that they have aspirations like maybe they want to achieve a certain career goal in their life because we've pigeonholed them and we've clipped their wings. Would you say that is still largely the case? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, there's a lot of work to do in, let's say, the the general world, but uh, especially in our like South Asian community, uh, we're miles behind that. Um, so when I was in college, this was a very tricky, tricky time in my life, and. You know, um, when you get a bit older uh, and you you go out by yourself, uh, I live in like a highly populated um, Asian area, um, and it, just going out, I noticed started noticing noticing people uh, just staring at me like old aunties and uncles um, because they've never seen someone like me in a wheelchair. Or, um, they stop what they're doing and then they just stare at me um, whilst I'm going past them or. Um, you know, or they've spotted me from across the supermarket and then they're just looking at me. Um, and they're, they're probably thinking nice things, like they're probably making du'a. Uh, looking probably, with sympathy. Yeah, yeah, a bit of sympathy. But, you know, for me at that age, it made me feel very uncomfortable because I'm like, um, why are they staring at me? And I didn't understand, like, why people were staring at me. But uh, And that made me feel like I don't want to go out. I don't want to really put myself in that situation. So I started to gain weight. Um, and you know, I, I was pretty chubby. Uh, I used to, I think I used to be about ten stone. And um, yeah, I can send you some uh, pictures later, which are quite funny now to look at. But um, um, so one way I got out of that was um, sport. Sport really helped me uh, to sort of um, give my conf- get my confidence back. So I started playing wheelchair basketball. And um, in wheelchair basketball, you're not allowed to smash into other wheelchairs. Uh, but I always used to get sent off for uh, smashing into other wheelchairs. Um, You're an aggressive so, player. Uh, yeah, yeah, very aggressive player. It's probably because I'm from Bolton a little bit. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, it was. Um, so as a as a South Asian community, I think we need to do a lot of things. And you know, um, humble is getting better. You know, people, there's more awareness out there. There's more uh, people that are second and third generation, which are getting uh, taught a little bit more about disability. And you know. Uh, the work that I do uh, outside, like going to uh, Muslim schools, uh, like little scout groups, and also like local school, lo- local schools as well, um, just to raise a bit of awareness. Um, so when I go into schools, like you can see the children saying, like whispering to themselves, like 
look how small he is, look at his legs, and then and then they're quite they're quite standoffish at first. But when I speak, I do my little presentation, show them a couple of cool videos of me playing sport, and then I'm like the hero. And then I get I get um, parents uh, messaging me on Instagram uh, or, or Twitter saying uh, you visited my child uh, my child's school like a week ago and he's still talking about you. So I thought I'd send you a message. Uh, thank you for making such an impact on it on them so um yeah so it, it's little things like that um, you know we need more champions in this area to to sort of uh, show people that um you know we don't need sympathy we don't we're, we're uh, you know we're just not like like people with disabilities living a normal life and you know we can achieve anything uh, that we want to achieve um if if we're not patronized if we're not like um, told that we can't do anything, you know. If we're given the platform to succeed, uh, we can achieve anything that, that that's possible. I think when you're younger, there's a large element of your life which probably, especially with a disability like that, where you're not in control of the the I mean the decisions, the life choices that you want to make. Maybe other people are making those choices for you. So this is probably where the patronizing aspect of it comes into it, because they think they know what's best for you. Maybe a school, yeah. it could be a special needs mentor. But in your case, obviously, you had somebody who was amazing. But it could have been the other way around with somebody who looked at you with sympathy, patronized you, and didn't give you or didn't let you fulfill your potential. And what, what age were you when you realized that sports was an avenue that you would like to pursue? Um, I think at, at the age of like 19, 18, 19, okay. um, because I really enjoyed it and people said I had good, good chess, good chess skills and good, good speed. Uh, but, you know, um, you have to find the right sport for you. And I, I was very lucky to be scouted by wheelchair rugby uh, because in wheelchair basketball, um, I'm not sure if you know about uh, Paralympic classifications. Um, so you have to have a certain type of disability to play each Paralympic sport. So okay. each sport has its own classification rules, as you as you name it. So um, that be so different in, in basketball and rugby. Yeah. So in in basketball, it's um, uh, just an impairment in one limb. So um, you could be playing against people with who have like a like a leg problem, and but they've got full upper body core. Whereas in wheelchair rugby, you have um, you have a more specific uh, classification, which is um, you have to have a, a disability, a, not a disability, an impairment in three or four limbs. So with my disability, uh, you know, my, my legs uh, haven't grown to the maximum effect. So, and then also I have uh, upper body limitations as well. So with my left hand, uh, I can extend my elbow, uh, but with my right hand, um, right arm, uh, my the joint at the elbow is fixed. Uh, a 90 degrees angle so um, I can't extend it out and so um, I have to do things left-handed um, more often than not uh, but you know still having that impairment I can still do things I can still push a wheelchair in a straight line and, and things like that um, so when wheelchair rugby came calling and they said look you look pretty rough because uh, they saw me smash around in wheelchair basketball and said why don't you try wheelchair rugby and I went down to uh, a Great Britain training camp just to get a taste of it, look like watch how the team train and what the sport is, and you know I absolutely, I absolutely fell in love with it, and um, and then I went to uh, my local team uh, in Southport, which which is at the time uh, the West Coast Wheelchair Rugby Club, and um, you know I think the, the the coach at the time said to me, you know, um, if you carry on, you know, the, you you're gonna do big things, so that gave me a lot of motivation to to carry on playing wheelchair rugby um, and yeah and you know it's not always been a, a successful glittering career that that you guys see right now you know it's uh it's come with its challenges so um, without within, doubt, without doubt. there must have been yeah within six tears of, uh, playing of tears along the way yeah uh, so within six months of playing wheelchair rugby i got called up into the great britain wheelchair rugby team to go to australia uh, my first ever time on a long haul flight um, and yeah, just um, after that tour, I got told, um, you know, it, it, it's not your time. You know, you, you're probably a little bit too small, a little bit too light uh, to play the sport. So um, you know, uh, at this moment in time, you know, you're not, 
we're not going to consider you for the GB team. Um, you know, that not that setback, because uh, I was all excited. I thought, oh, um, I could be potentially playing for Great Britain. But uh, to get that setback, um, you know, it was quite tough. And uh, for me, I found something that I really enjoyed. Um, I got the adrenaline rush from playing wheelchair rugby. So I carried on playing um, and started to develop my own um, unique style of play, which was like more turny, agile. And, um, you know, playing for my team, the West Coast Wheelchair Rugby Club, we, we won the, the league for the first time in the club's uh, history because um, it's quite in its infancy then. And, you know, I started to play really well and started to get noticed again. And uh, for me to work back into the GB team, I just didn't get put back in straight away. I had to work myself through the, the GB development team uh, where I got selected and um, we played a competition in Prague and I won, um, I was voted the, the best player in my position in the All-Star team. And then uh, after the London 2012 Paralympics, uh, I got my chance into the GB team again because of my good form and a couple of players retired uh, from the GB team. Um, and I felt I had to take that second chance to... Um, you know, solidify my place, and uh, I hope that you know I uh, was voted in the best uh, in the All Star team for that tournament on my up on my return. So since 2013 up until um, the back end of 2022, uh, I've been a GB athlete. So, so you weren't getting sent off now for smashing into other people's wheelchairs. Um, yeah, you do get you can get sent off in wheelchair rugby because you you can't hit from behind or uh, you can't physically touch somebody, uh, but. Uh, yeah, you get sent off for those sort of things. Uh, you get put in the same bin. And were you finding that a lot of your, uh, your colleagues or players in the opposing team, were they a lot bigger than you? Yeah, so I'm probably one of the smallest players in the world. Um, and uh, But, you know, uh, I don't think that stopped me from, from playing international level. And, uh, it was quite unique uh, to the team as well. So I bought a certain set of skills uh, that other players didn't really have. So, you know, was that, that was quite useful. Uh, just more turning, agile, and a bit of agility as well. Uh, sorry, agile and agility is the same word, is it? So mo- mostly agility. Um, and um, just just being able to uh, pass the ball well and uh, getting away from people and uh, my one-on-one defensive skills as well, which is pretty good. Um, Do you have yeah, good uh, upper body strength? Yeah, you have to train. Uh, so this is this was a full-time job for me. Um, so you, you're training uh, six to seven times a week, uh, and some of those days you're, you're doing double sessions. Uh, and then as a Great Britain uh, team, we we train uh, not not so far from you actually, uh, the uh, Lillishall National Sports Centre uh, near Telford, um, and uh, that's that was our training base. We um, used to meet uh, for four days a week, uh, four days a month. Sorry, uh, we used to train twice a week, uh, twice a day. And we used to have our meals. Uh, it's like a big, big training facility. So we train in one area, uh, eat in one area, and sleep in the other area. So uh, it, they're quite rough camps. So you'd wake up at seven o'clock, uh, eight o'clock breakfast. You're in your, you're you're on court for nine thirty till twelve. Then you'd have your lunch, and then you're back back on the court for for two two p.m. and then till five p.m. and then you go for dinner, and then you have a team meeting for video analysis, and then uh, by that time. It's 8 p.m. and you're ready to go to sleep um, back back to your room. So it's quite a, a it's like a boot camp basically. But um, and those were once a month for four days. Uh, but once you are gearing up for 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 more competitions, you know those those training camps um, uh, became more frequent. Uh, or in the lead up to the Tokyo 2020 Paralympics, it was like every 10 days, every 12 days. Those, those camps. So when you were in Bolton, where were you training? Was it mostly at home, or did you have a place like a gym where you were frequenting? Um, so I trained at the uh, Bolton Arena Gym, which uh, kindly gave me a free membership. Um, and, you, you know, that's just for my uh, strength and conditioning. So, um, you know, just go there do, lifting weights and using the, the cardio machines. And um, and then every Monday I trained in Sheffield um, with, with, with a club with my club team and another club team. And every Saturday I trained in my club team uh, and uh, also... Um, doing um, conditioning sessions with another teammate in in Morecambe as well. So, um, yeah, it was pretty full on. And then the days where I didn't have to travel, um, I'd train in Bolton at the gym. 
So now that you've retired, are you still training as regularly as you were before? Yeah, all all habits die hard to be honest. Um, but um, yeah, it, I'm not training um, to the level that I was, uh, but I'm still doing my club my club training sessions, which is now once a week, uh, and then uh, just doing a couple of gym sessions to to keep fit. Uh, I did have like a, a period when I retired where I just completely didn't do anything and then just binged out on food or all the foods that you couldn't really have. Uh, and then I realized I, I, I was starting to put weight on. So I thought I'm going to have to um, like curb it back a little bit and just carry on um, just staying fit, keeping fit because, you know, uh, especially a person with a disability um, and, you know, back when I was younger, I was finding things very difficult, pushing my own chair because of my weight. So um, it, it's important for me to, to stay fit, yeah. uh, just to keep my independence. What's the typical as a, cardio training that you do? Yeah, so uh, we I, I do a, a session on the, the rowing machine or a session on the ski erg or handbike, uh, depending on um, how I'm feeling that day. Uh, and then also we, we do a bit of cardio in our club training sessions just to keep ourselves a bit fit. So that's in-chair in chair fitness. So... Um, so, and then I do a lot of like resistance band work just to keep the muscles uh, muscles going, and then lifting bench press, dumbbells, uh, and um, I've, I've started to fall in love with the ring work as well, like uh, doing my gymnastic stuff as well. So that, that's that's pretty good as well. Fantastic. You said you mentioned about retirement. You said you fell into retirement. Are you retired, or you you come back out of retirement? No, um, uh, I'm still in retirement, uh, but like I say, um, uh, all the habits that I had, like I, um, I like to like to keep fit, and yeah, I just decided uh, back end of twenty twenty two, I, uh, you know, it was the right time for me to for to retire, and um, you know, um, yeah, I went through all the stages of grief, like uh, if you made the right decision, or like what am I going to do for the future, and uh, a bit angry about it, and <laughs> uh, but you know. Uh, uh, I hope that you know, like um, Allah is the best of plans, and um, let's see, let's see what happens uh, in the future. We're, we're and, uh, too young to no. retire, as yeah, it's it's thirty three, but uh, if you think about it, it's been uh, like a, a twelve year career at club and country, where it, it takes a lot out of your body, and I was starting to get more injuries and wasn't able to train as effectively as uh, as I wanted to. So um, and. Yeah, just just the right time and uh, time to give um, the newer guys, uh, the young guys, um, uh, a chance. And, well, I'm still keeping that, my hand uh, with coaching, so I'm coaching my my club team, and I'm also coaching um, the GB. Well, helping out coaching the uh, GB development team as well. So, well we understand uh, the yeah. need for wanting to give the body a bit more rest to stop yourself from getting any future and further inju injuries. But obviously, from a career point of view, have you thought of what you would like to do now that you're not actively competing in sports? Yeah, so uh, at the moment, um, I'm just enjoying my time off uh, because um, it's it's been a long career where I've been traveling everywhere, uh, traveling the world and uh, having pressures on you every day, for what you're eating, how much you're training. So I'm just enjoying um, the relaxation time at the moment. Um, I'm still doing uh, motivational speaking uh, I've got my own company set up, the AB10 Revolution, which uh, I go and do school visits uh, and got do my motivational speaking through that as well. And I'm also doing some some coaching with the the Great Britain uh, development team as well, where um, I'm hoping um, you know just to build up my my coaching experience and uh, maybe that could be a, a career which um, I could pursue as well. Um, so let's let's see what the future holds. I think you'd make a great mentor, not just necessarily for disabled athletes, but generally for people who want to achieve anything notable in their lives. And your story should be told up and down in schools, in workplaces, is just to motivate people at work and in any industry. Because, you know, there's people who put limitations upon themselves, suffer from low self-esteem, confidence, and they could do with inspiration from somebody like yourself. Yeah, um, you know, uh, the way I see it is I just live my life um, and whatever Allah has decreed for me. And if people get inspiration from that, uh, you know, that, that's that's a great thing. Um, 
but yeah, it's it's important. You know, uh, people have struggles, but um, you should always remember. Um, you know what what's happening to you at the moment is uh, take take the care and the, take the lesson in 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 that struggle at the time. And you know, um, I've had a very very uh, tough career. Um, you know, but I won't change it for anything. Uh, all the disappointments, all the uh, all the setbacks that we I've had during my career, uh, but you know, it all culminated by winning the gold medal. And you know, I, I think I was crying uh, when I was happy and handed the medal because of uh, all the career. Like I, I was just like uh, reviewing and reflecting on the journey that that got us here. And um, you know, uh, and I think I was just like making the world to a lot of the time and, and just saying thank you and um, you know uh, at the time you don't realize why it's happening to you but um, you know in the future you look back on certain moments and think um, okay uh, now I understand why I was put through that test so uh, every day we're being tested it's about how you how you deal with it how you how you overcome it and it's always Makes important to have like a, a positive uh, can do attitude as well and you know just just get out there and um, just do what you can to improve your situation. Obviously, with through your achievements, you've been awarded an MBE as well. That was also probably a very proud moment for you and your family. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Um, you know, the, the late Queen's um, uh, New Year's honor list in 2021. Um, sorry, 2022 it was. Um, and I recently picked that up in December. Uh, I, got, I got to take my, uh, my dad and my sister to, to Windsor Castle to meet Prince William, where... I was handed the MBE and um, yeah, I got to have a good, good two, three minute chat with uh, Prince William and uh, uh, I actually mentioned to him about, um, you know, the, the perceptions of disability within the South Asian community and um, uh, how I hope to just change one or two people's minds and, um, you know, educate people. And he was quite surprised about um, how how open I was and how... Um, like he didn't know about the perceptions of disability within my, within our community, so um, he that, that's what um, you know surprised him the most. And uh, I was glad to that I was open enough to to speak to that about him within my two three minute chat with him. Uh, and yeah, it was a special moment for for my family um, uh, just to see Windsor Castle and uh, meet the royals and just be in the same room. And um, yeah, I'll never forget that day. And I've got got all the pictures and the videos and. Uh, to look back on it you must share that with us we would like to put that on uh, this uh, podcast to highlight that uh, inshallah and uh, you know it's been great sharing this journey with yourself because as i said to you people don't see the blood sweat and tears behind the achievement the struggle the days when you wake up in the morning and you don't feel like getting up because they only focus on that pivotal moment when you're standing on that step receiving that gold medal and uh, you know that is just probably one percent of the whole journey the 99 percent of it they don't see and that's it's important for people to really see that and be exposed to that journey and as you said it, it, that's what's made you the man that you are now today yeah um like i said i, I want to change uh, my journey for for anything and um if anything, it's taught me a lot of, uh, it's built character, it's built resilience, it's built, uh, it's given me confidence that uh, anything in my life, you know, any little setback, um, you know, you can have a little bit of a mob about it, but uh, I've got a rule where it's like one day and then next day you get up and you you try and uh, make things happen yourself. Um, so it's always important to just believe you can do, you can do anything. And yeah, um, you know, people, there's lots of Olympians and Paralympians out there that um, you know that, that don't win a medal and um, all their work gets unrecognised. So we shouldn't be um, you know applauded for our, just for our success just because I've won a Paralympian uh, Paralympic medal because uh, I've been on both ends. Uh, so in after Rio 2016, we didn't we didn't win a medal uh, and really nobody nobody wanted to know um, what what you were getting up to and then. Uh, when you finally win a Paralympic medal, you know, everybody wants to know you. So uh, it's important to celebrate uh, any any success that people have, uh, no matter how minimal you think it is, it's still a success. So 
Um, you know, the, there's lots of power beings out there that don't win the medal, but they've just um, they've they've made an achievement just to just to win, uh, just to be at a Paralympics, and that should be celebrated as well. Um, and it's very very humbling of you to mention them, and at the end of the day, that's part of the character that you have to have. That as well as you know being successful, you have to have your feet firmly grounded and be humble. And you've quite you know rightly recognised the role of family mentors and also the Almighty Lord Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala in this journey, because all success is attributed to the favours of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Ayaz Bhutta, it's been a great pleasure to speak to you and for you to share this journey with us. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala allow you to continue your success or whatever you decide to do now. And as I've said before, that you've got a very, very inspiring story to share, and we hope that you will continue to share that, inspire many more Olympians, Paralympians, and all young generation to come. Inshallah. Inshallah, I mean, I mean, and uh, thank you very much. Um, it's been an absolute honour, and yeah, just let's just uh, do what we can to to make a little bit of a difference in the world. Uh, we'll so, certainly yeah. be keeping an eye on your progress, and hopefully, be you know sharing future success stories of yours, no doubt. Again, so thank you once again. We'll see you again. Thank you. Bye bye.